we record anything in progress apparently. Um, and I'm delighted today to be joined by uh, Dr. Ashley Jackson. Um, Ashley is co-director of the Center for the Study of Armed Groups at the Overseas Development Institute, ODI. Um, is someone who has a lot of uh, experience working in the humanitarian development sector um, in, in various countries around the world, but it's also um, done a PhD in war studies. Um, I had the honor of, of being Ashley's supervisor um, and I got quite a bit of insight um, into the research that's gone into this book um, and the really impressive field work um, that she conducted in Afghanistan with civilians, members of the Taliban, hundreds of interviews, um, in-depth interviews as well, and a very in-depth field work. Um, so I'm delighted that Ashley is here today to talk to us about her book, Negotiating Survival. Um, and um, she's going to talk about the, the idea behind the book, the ideas of the book, and also, I think, um, talk about you know, the, very, the timeliness of the book and how it helps us understand what's happening today. Um, after Ashley's uh, spoken to us, we're then going to be joined by Professor Matt Spadell, Professor of Security Development here in the Department of War Studies too, who was Ashley's second supervisor. And Mats is going to um, just raise some, some questions, offer some reflections on, on Ashley's talk. And Mats has also got quite a bit of experience and um, interest in Afghanistan. Um, so after that, we will then go straight to you, the audience, for some questions. Now, the way we're going to deal with questions is you'll need to put them into the Q&A box. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you should have a little Q&A box. So that's different to the chat box. If you type the questions in there, I will try and get through as many as, as I can. I'll pose those to Ashley. I might group some together um, and um, we'll do that after uh, Matt and Ashley have, have, have made their comments. So without further ado, Ashley, thank you very much for joining us. It's great to have you back uh, in the department again. Um, over to you. Uh, thanks, Karen. Uh, so, you know, this book is about really, as, as Karen sort of talked about, it's about two interrelated things. The first is life under Taliban rule uh, and how people have navigated and survived the Taliban's return. All of this research was of course done before August when the Taliban was still an insurgency, an insurgency that controlled much of the country, but an insurgency nonetheless. Um, and as Karen said, I spent two years doing hundreds of interviews, traveling to different provinces, villages in the country, talking to civilians, anyone who would talk to me about their experiences with the Taliban, as well as Taliban commanders and fighters, um, shadow governance officials, things like tax collectors and education monitors, just to understand what life was like uh, under the Taliban. And I started this work in 2017, when I think most of the world had kind of forgotten about Afghanistan. I'd slipped from the front pages. There were a few international forces left. And you didn't really have a sense of, of what was going on in the country if you were outside of the country. In fact, you could find reports about the Taliban's sort of shadow state in the Afghan media, uh, but not really in the international media. And you had a really scaled down NGO and UN presence as well. And that's just sort of to set the scene for how I went about this and what I found out. And you know, the book begins with one man's story. Uh, of how he's sort of survived, uh, survived and negotiated life under the Taliban. And he's uh, a guy I give a pseudonym to, we call him Haji Aman, but he's a village elder. Uh, and I meet him at a point where the Taliban has just taken over his village uh, effectively. And so they govern pretty much everything. And when I meet Haji Man, he insists that life is better under the Taliban. And when I, I push further, it emerges that life is better simply because there's less violence, but there's a lot more problems for Haji Man to deal with now that the Taliban have taken over. Um, because he's a village elder, people expect him to solve all these problems that directly or indirectly relate to the Taliban's takeover. You know, the Taliban has stopped aid work that is happening in the village. They're taxing farmers more than they used to before they took over. They're doing all sorts of things. They're planting IEDs in populated places. They've shut down the schools uh, and people are very upset, but they can't do anything, of course, because they're afraid of the Taliban. And they do expect that uh, community elders like Amman will somehow deal with the Taliban. 
Now, at this point, when the Taliban takes over, Amman doesn't have much interaction with the Taliban. He knows some of them, he knows some of the people who've joined them, um, but he has to, to make linkages to, to who the key decision makers are in the village, you know, who's actually gonna help fix the problems, who has to say. And then when he finally meets them, he raises a number of these issues and the Taliban shuts him down on every single one. But he senses that at least on the schools, on reopening the schools in the village, in the area, it's not a firm no. It's a no, but if he comes up with a plan, if he comes up with a proposition to the Taliban, he might be able to get them reopened. So that's what he pursues. He goes back, he tries to think of a plan to reopen the schools, but it's not as simple as going to the Taliban and saying, you've got to reopen the schools. It's really complicated. A lot of the schools, when they were shut down because of fighting, were damaged, they were looted, some of them down to the window panes, they don't have books. They definitely don't have teachers. Either the teachers are sitting at home or they fled the area. And the problem is the teachers are employed by the government ministry of education. And what Amman has to do then is convince the government to reopen the schools and hire new teachers. But he also at the same time would have to convince the Taliban to approve, and of course, they'd want to vet these teachers that are working in their areas. And so it's a delicate multi-step plan that, that Amman has to come, come up with. And he has to work out all these kinds of moving pieces on all sides. Of course, he also has to convince parents to send their kids back to school and that it's safe. So he goes back to the Taliban and he says, look, I understand you don't want these NGO projects to go forward. I understand that you're not gonna lighten up on the taxes but can you reopen schools? I have a plan. And the Taliban's first reaction is to be annoyed. You know, we've already talked about this. We say, we're not gonna open the schools, but Amman does something interesting. He says, look, people are very, very upset. They don't like what you're doing here. They're too afraid to tell you, but I'll tell you what the community is thinking. And I can't predict that if you don't act responsibly, if you don't give them something, I can't predict what they'll do. And so when I'm interviewing him, he sort of smiles as he says this, uh, because what he's doing is he's leveraging the community to get what he wants or to get what the community wants. Um, and he gets away with it. It works. The Taliban has no choice after Amman has come to them with a veiled threat effectively, um, but also a plan in which, you know, he's negotiated with the government, parents convinced some teachers to work, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they have to give him something. They realize that they have to give him something in order to keep the community happy. And, you know, this is not a unique story. I interviewed scores and scores of people who did similar things in their communities, who had other kinds of negotiations, NGOs, businessmen, uh, truck drivers, uh, people whose relatives had been kidnapped or had been sitting in a Taliban jail. Almost everyone had a story like this or knew someone who had a story like this. Because this is what the Taliban has been doing for years. This is how, how they made a comeback. This is how they survived and how they endured was by negotiating coercively, violently, but negotiating with civilians. And when I first went to Afghanistan as an aid worker in 2009, this pattern was already kind of starting. Um, this is not new. This is a decade old, decade and a half old of negotiations. 2009 was right before a big military surge, which was supposed to rout the Taliban. But in fact, you know, they came back stronger than ever eventually. Um, and even then NGOs were talking about quote unquote, using community acceptance to, uh, to remain present in insecure or volatile areas. There are all these euphemisms around what was going on, um, but these were sort of the nascent kinds of engagements that Amman and others were doing on behalf of, of aid agencies so that they could continue working in villages as the Taliban started to reemerge. But the problem is, or the problem when I set out to do this research was that we knew so little about how these deals were struck. Nobody really wanted to talk about it. The stakes were high. The consequences of talking to or dealing with or cutting deals with the Taliban were severe. Um, so we knew very little about how these deals were negotiated, renegotiated and contested. But if you went and talked to people like I did, you, you very quickly understood that they shared information, they strategized, that there was a whole culture of how to engage with the Taliban. 
the problem was, is that it wasn't really incorporated into the way that we saw the war. It was an essential part of the way the war played out, at least from the Taliban's perspective. But I think in part because everyone was so focused on violence, on violent incidences, on big offenses, on IEDs, on the Taliban's spectacular attacks, this kind of course of negotiation um, that enabled the Taliban to survive and thrive was overlooked. And I think that was one of the many, many mistakes uh, of, the, of the intervention. And that's sort of what the, the second part of the book is about. Um, and that's how the Taliban returned to power. I mean, this is the other side of the coin, right? The, the Taliban built a strategy around this kind of engagement, around the combination of violence and negotiation to, to gain a foothold in village after village and expand right throughout the country. Now, I completed proofs for this book back in April, and that was before the Taliban made a sweeping advance through the north, uh, where they took uh, about 200 districts. And then they finally captured, of course, the, the capital of Kabul in August. The book came out in September. Uh, and of course, I, I looked back, you know, finally kind of through a clenched fist to see, you know, did it hold up? Did this analysis actually hold up to how things unfolded? when so many people were surprised, when there was so much uh, lamenting that, you know, how could this have happened? And so when I went back through, actually, it turns out very much of this tells the story of exactly how this happened. You know, if I were given the chance to edit it again, I, I honestly wouldn't change very much. Uh, I think there's a typo on page 135, but you know, other than that, um, it really does sort of leave off before the Taliban's takeover, but it, it traces the path. In at least 200 of the, the districts that the Taliban took in that, that offensive through the north uh, in May, at least half of those 200 districts, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't you know, a really military offensive, it was a negotiated surrender. The Taliban used negotiation to take a lot of terrain. Now, a lot of this terrain, they already de facto controlled, or they controlled 80 to 90% of these districts that were taken. I mean, maybe you would have one or two uh, government buildings in the, the district center. This is the case in, in, in several of the districts that I visited that, you know, quote unquote, fell during that period. But it was a, it was a Taliban area. You couldn't do anything uh, without, without the Taliban say so. And that includes government officials still living in those districts. They kind of had to negotiate the Taliban presence as well. Um, but the Taliban controlled the terrain, the behavior, the movement, the everyday conduct of the lives of tens of millions uh, of Afghans. And I think that's something that, you know, when we talk about color-coded 2D maps, or if anyone's familiar with these maps that the Long War Journal or CIGAR produced, which showed, sort of showed government control, Taliban control, and contested areas. I mean, we've all known for a very long time, those of us who've been engaged in, in trying to understand the conflict, that those maps were um, dangerously deceptive and misleading uh, because it's not really about flag planting and zero sum notions of control. It's about these overlapping layers of often coercive influence, but also about pro providing incentives, about, in the Taliban's case, Sharia courts, which you know even a year ago, extended uh, into the Kabul suburbs, you know, in areas that were a short drive from the presidential palace, you would have a Taliban court. Um, so it's, it's that kind of strategy that we failed to, to understand. And it wasn't a failure of understanding, it was a failure to pay attention to what was really going on, to the ways in which Afghans themselves were experiencing the war. Um, and I think it just sort of shows how outdated some of our notions are about how modern wars from Afghanistan to Somalia to Yemen are, are fought and won. Um, but of course, you know, the Taliban itself kind of incorporated iteratively this, this strategy over the course of a decade. And the, the third chapter of the book really uh, focuses on the Taliban. The rest focus very much on civilians. Um, but they combine, you know, and they learn, they learn by doing, they learn um, by successive sort of uh, experiences of trying different things in different places over a decade and a half. 
they developed this strategy where they combine violence with persuasion, with incentives like allowing schools, such as in Amman's case, um, or Sharia courts and the, the services, quote unquote, that they, they provided. And they also use social capital as well. Um, the networks and relationships and emotional ties that allow them to gather intelligence, but also to, to negotiate with people. Um, you know, I interviewed village elders and even government officials and security officials who had brothers, cousins, uncles in the insurgency. Um, the Taliban, for the most part, isn't from outside. There are commanders and fighters and uh, were, were commanders and fighters and shadow governors from the actual communities. Um, and that allowed the Taliban a foothold, a way to engage with the population, but it also allowed the community a way to pull on those emotional ties. You know, you should provide the schools, you shouldn't plant IEDs in the bazaar, et cetera, et cetera. So civilians use all of the same kinds of elements to negotiate with the Taliban. They don't have the kind of capacity for violence, for example, that the Taliban has, but they can withhold or grant their compliance to the Taliban, just like Haji Amman did with that subtle threat of, I can't control what will happen. On the other hand, he could deliver kind of the collective compliance of the community. He could manage the discontent of the community for the Taliban. And people leverage this ability, you know, these offers of help to the Taliban, whether it's to inform for them, to act with act as intermediaries with aid agencies, whatever it is, they they use creative forms of leverage to get protection from the, the violence that the Taliban would otherwise inflict or to get benefits either for their community and their family or for themselves. Um, and, you know, we see this play out across society, you know, NGOs, trucking firms, you know, these, these entities can offer, doctors, health clinics can offer things that the Taliban wants, whether it's medical services, whether it's bribes, whether it's taxes, whether it's aid projects. And people very quickly learn how to again, negotiate with this, to use this to their advantage. Um, and the Taliban also, particularly after 2014, after they really gain uh, a significant territorial foothold, they realize that they need, they need these entities. They need to provide schools, they need aid projects, they need businesses to keep flowing because they're preparing to take over. They have more of a, a state in waiting like posture. They're building this sort of, uh, a uh, shadow state, as, as hollow as it might be in some respects, it's, it's the infrastructure and the performative aspects of the state which start to influence their behavior where they really try and get UN agencies to work in their areas and those kinds of things. Uh, but I don't wanna go on too long because you can of course read the book and I'm, I'm interested to hear you know, what Matt has to say and, and any other questions, but that's effectively what the book is about. The centrality and the complexity of the Taliban's relationship with civilians in the past two decades of war in Afghanistan, and how, despite such a focus on counterinsurgency, stabilization, hearts and minds, how deeply misunderstood and overlooked the, the civilian perspective has been. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it there. And I should also, before I, I pause to hand over to Matt and Kieran, I should thank them, uh, not only for being here today, but they've been here since day one of, of this journey, being my thesis supervisors, <laughs> uh, having to navigate the ethical uh, clearance for <laughs> this research, which you can imagine wasn't very easy, um, and providing advice on exactly how to do this all along the way. Uh, but with that, I'll, I'll pause there and hand back to Kieran and Matt. Matt, would you like to uh, come straight in? Sure. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity to, I think, open the discussion more than anything else. And as you've just heard now, I was actually very privileged to be able to act as a second supervisor on this uh, on this project. It started as a as a PhD and has now become a book. And, and the, the first sort of general point I simply wanted to make is the, the extraordinary importance of, of this work as an example of, of research that tries to look at the relationship between the Taliban and the civilian population. When I say the importance of it as an example, there are many other cases, many other contemporary conflict with that particular dimension has also been neglected, as you say, and has been overlooked 
uh, leaving us really in the dark uh, when it comes to understanding the dynamics on the ground. And I think that is incredibly valuable. And of course, I think that was brought out, and I'd like to talk a little bit about this when we come to the, the dramatic uh, collapse of the regime in August. Um, I think um, by any measure, uh, it, it was a, a, in many ways an extraordinarily intelligence failure um, not to see and predict um, the nature of that collapse and the speed of it. Now, many will say that, you know, we saw it coming, but not the speed and the nature of it. And it's fascinating, as you say, and it's certainly a great credit to your research that you didn't actually have to go back and, and, and change your, your manuscript um, uh, much afterwards, because uh, your analysis of relations between uh, the civilian population and Taliban up to that point uh, made this particular outcome uh, likely. Um, but I would like to ask you uh, about the about the the nature of that relationship a little bit uh, a little bit more uh, uh, in greater detail. I mean, you are right; it is a pioneering work in that respect. But there are others, of course, in this debate, which is now you know developing around the nature of the collapse and so on and so forth. Others that have emphasised that and probably gone further than you, you might correct me here, that the Taliban, for all that it's, it's, we know about it as a movement, gradually developed, um, certainly in the areas it controlled, a degree of local legitimacy uh, and even some um, uh, public appeal. I'm quoting here people like Anatol Levin and Gilles Doronsoro. I think you emphasized um, in your presentation more the element of violence and negotiations and simply stepping into that particular vacuum. But I wonder whether you'd, you'd, you'd care to comment a little bit on, 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 on that uh, view that in actual fact, um, it had an appeal because it was actually compensating uh, for central government uh, and deficiencies. And, and that to some extent, it responded to, you know, to popular demand for, for certain kinds of, of public services. Um, uh, and, and the failure to see and understand that was one reason why people didn't understand that uh, essentially the takeover was largely one of, of in many cases, negotiating a, 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 a transfer. The second sort of big question, I suppose, building on that, I wanted to ask you, because you have emphasized um, the closeness of that relationship over time and, and the degree of sort of penetration, I mean, uneven of, of, of Taliban in certain areas of people's life. I wonder what that means about the future and where we are going now. It's a very lively debate, as you know, at the moment in the United Nations, in many capitals, about how we should relate, how we should engage with the Taliban um, and how, aid of various forms, humanitarian and others, should be channeled through to them. I wonder whether the fact that they have established uh, uh, governance structures, whether that opens certain possibilities which might not have been there in the future, and how you see that, that, that developing in the months ahead. We have the renewal of UNAMA's mandate, for example, coming up uh, in, in March, and I think there is a lot of debate in capitals about the most meaningful way of engaging it. Does this history that you have you have you've outlined for us, uh, provide us with a very different starting point um, from, from earlier. So those are the two broad broad questions uh, I wanted to, to start off the discussion, but I want to just to congratulate you again and also encourage people to, to buy and read the book because it does provide a very different um, part of the story, one which, as I suggest, you know, the events of, of August uh, illustrate uh, have been, been overlooked and neglected, as you suggest. So I leave it with that, Ashley. Uh, thanks, Max, for those really thoughtful comments and incredibly difficult questions. <laughs> I'll do my, my best um, to, to answer them. Just starting with legitimacy and public appeal, um, I really dislike the word legitimacy just as much as I like the word support when people talk about, you know, support for the Taliban, these kinds of things. And I say that from a place of having started this project, unconsciously kind of using those, those frameworks, um, but learning the hard way just how uh, inappropriate they were uh, and how they weren't the right language to reflect the civilian experience. I don't think civilians 
thought about legitimacy in the way that that we do. Of course, they didn't think about it in the way that uh, scholars do. But first of all, when you talk to someone, it's very likely in a war zone, if you ask them how they feel about one of the combatants, they're going to give you a false preference on the first ask. And you'll, you'll be very lucky if you get down to some sense of how they really feel, which is when you do incredibly complex and not always a coherent as it, as it wouldn't be because emotions are involved, because fear is involved, because often there's no good option, which I think is how most people I met felt. They didn't like the government. They didn't like the Taliban. They were exhausted. They had been born into a war. A lot of the people I met were obviously, um, yeah, they didn't know a time when there wasn't a conflict. After 2001, there was a sort of brief reprieve, um, but it almost felt like a re-traumatizing false start to many of them. Uh, and so I think what we have to, our starting place has to be that people are exhausted, that they probably don't see any option as ideal. Uh, and they may do with what they can. And they also think about the short term because, because the present is so volatile, it's very difficult to think about the future, right? To think about what happens next. I mean, towards the end of my research, it was clear in certain areas that people were expecting expecting the Taliban to take over and not expecting peace negotiations, by the way, to, to work out terribly well, um, which you know, of course they were right. But so they were po poising themselves for that. They were strategizing for that, but a lot of them couldn't think beyond next week or et cetera. You know? So this idea of support, I think it needs to be rethought. I talk about compliance. There are other scholars and our, our Jonah, others who, who use different terminology. Um, but there has been a lot made about, okay, the, the government was so bad that the Taliban came in with these services and these, these things and they, they, they won popular support. They, they weren't corrupt um, or they were able to provide justice to these Sharia courts when the, the, the Afghan government courts were notoriously uh, complicated, corrupt and inept. And there's some truth to that. I've done really extensive work on the Taliban courts, trying to look at how they work, trying to talk to people about their experiences. And that's an interesting example in the fact that, you know, the Taliban's justice is very simple. It's still political. There's still a degree of corruption, um, but it's easy for people to understand. It's more reliable, but it's again, like a lowest common denominator equation. It's, it's the best that they can get. Um, and I think we we underestimate that, that that you have a situation in which people are so exhausted and so desperate that, you know, they just, they want what you or I would want in that situation. They want safety, security, uh, and they want to be left alone to live their lives. And the Taliban administration is inept, you know, beyond courts, they, they aren't made of bureaucrats. They're the opposite of Ashraf Ghani, an ex-World Bank official. They... They don't know how to run things. They know how to wage a military campaign. But I think what we're seeing now is, is there severe limitations in, in what they can provide people. And all throughout this research, I should say, people were very, very clear on that, right? They didn't, they would talk about how even the Taliban's version of Islam was an ignorant version of Islam. You know, they didn't really know anything. They certainly didn't know about schools or da, 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 all those kinds of things. So I think we have to question those narratives of the Taliban winning because they were somehow better or more legitimate or they were able to provide more than the state. I think it's more complicated. Um, on engaging with the Taliban now and whether or not aid is a means to do that, I, I think aid is a means to keep uh, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people from starving to death at this point, like that is, that the humanitarian imperative of um, a looming famine has to be how, how aid is framed. I think what we've seen is that the Taliban, what I've written about is they're really good at negotiating. They, they drive an incredibly hard bargain. That's what the book uh, documents is that, you know, this is central to their military strategy, their political strategy, what we've seen in Doha, they gave almost nothing up and got a US withdrawal. Um, so thinking you can sort of buy them off, it's not going to work, right? It's absolutely not going to work. You may be able to persuade them through kind of multi-pronged diplomatic strategy to do certain things. Um, 
but they're very unyielding. So to think that, for example, um, you can get them to embrace women's rights if you if you give them enough aid, that's you know that's an overly simplistic argument, but that's not going to happen. What we're seeing work on the ground, though, with girls' schools is local level quiet, local level negotiations, province by province, district by district. You're seeing more girls' schools reopen. It isn't an official Taliban policy at the top. There's this weird ambiguity where they told girls to stay home, et cetera. But you're seeing things on the ground be negotiated. And I think that's how it works. That's how it will kind of unfold. The international community strategy then has to be based on, okay, what is gonna enable different contingents and constituencies in different parts of the country best negotiate with this new government? And that's, that's what it's about. That's what it's about, it's empowering Afghans themselves in incredibly impossible, difficult circumstances to figure out the way forward and to negotiate it as they have been now for, for many, many years. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it there for, for the moment. Thanks, Ashley. Thank Thanks, you. Max, for the, uh, for the excellent questions and comments as well. We've got quite a lot of questions already in the Q&A box. Um, as I mentioned, if you if you have a question, um, just pop it in the Q&A box and we'll we'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, I'll start from, from uh, the top, perhaps, and we'll start with one. Um, I might bunch some more together later on. Um, so the first question from um, Daniel. Could you elaborate on, on why is you believe the dynamic that you've described um, has remained unknown in the wider discourse around Afghanistan and foreign assistance more generally. Where do you locate that failure? I don't know. I mean, there's a lot, it, it surfaces in different ways, right? There's a huge uh, literature industry around humanitarian access negotiations, right? And that's what part of this kind of overlaps to. Um, this dynamic exists in those in humanitarian diplomacy, we, this is how aid agencies have been operating for years in in places from Biafra to, <laughs> to Afghanistan in the in the eighties and nineties to you know you name it. Um, so it exists, but I think the way we conceptualize conflict and the way you know certain post two thousand one narratives around counterterrorism really. Um, shut down the ability to see things clearly on the ground, to engage with the Taliban, to engage with civilians directly, to understand what kind of deals they were striking. I think you've had a bunkerization of diplomats and, and others in Afghanistan, which prevents them from actually uh, getting the knowledge that they need and the insights that they need to really understand the situation. Instead, they're, they're caught, they were caught in sort of embassy green zone echo chambers. And that isn't to slam the people who are in those jobs who are often very intelligent and committed, but it's the infrastructure of how we engage in these places that we build barriers, that we put people on sanctions lists that they can never get off, <laughs> you know, that fit, it puts blinders on. And they're also discursive blinders, right? You can't, I'm sitting in, in Nairobi now trying to um, learn more about how, you know, Al Shabaab and how these dynamics might be more different uh, or similar to, to Afghanistan. And you have less space to talk about engagement with Al Shabaab. They've been around for decades. How are you ever going to understand why they keep coming back and why everything you have done so far has failed to solve the problem that they present if you don't engage with them, if you don't listen to them? I think that's part of it as well, is that particularly in the post 9-11 era, we've stopped talking to our enemies. Um, there's rarely even sort of back channel kind of dialogues in the way that there might've been uh, during the Cold War, let's say, or that there was you know, with the IRA or others, there are other historical examples where I think we've moved, we've moved backwards. And what it's meant is that there's no way out of these wars other than either keep fighting somehow uh, or withdraw and cede the ground as we've seen happen in Afghanistan. Uh, and there has to be a better way, honestly. Um, but so yeah, I think there are many dimensions to that, to that problem. There were, there were quite a few questions about um, responses um, and a few questions also uh, in, in more specific detail on the, on the argument you make in the book. I'll start with the, um, 
maybe the kind of the responses one. So Antonio asks a question, actually there's two parts to this question. The first is, um, why do you think the US and Afghan authorities um, have failed to tackle the less spectacular elements of the Taliban interventions in local settings? So for example, you know, um, imposing order, there's so much academic attention on governance failures, yet they've not addressed that, which I guess is partly what you, you've just been talking about. The second question, this is a separate question, um, he's asking about methodology. How did you overcome the logistical and security challenges in doing interviews in rural Afghanistan? I want to combine that with um, part of the question um, from Nicholas Barker as well, who asks, um, could you talk more about the ethics involved in conducting the research, how you dealt with issues like informed consent? And managing the risks to interviewees and to yourself. I think that, that's similar to the methods question that Antonio was asking. Yeah, maybe I'll I'll start with um, the governance failures. I mean, there's a whole industry around uh, subnational governance, stabilization, all these kinds of things. We've just talked about where the, one would try to understand this, those dynamics and address them, right? But that's not really what happened on the ground in Afghanistan. What happened was USIAD gave millions to um, contracting firms who had burn rates and had to spend money on ridiculous things. That money um, fueled corruption, fueled then insecurity, created a war economy that perpetuated insecurity and also disenfranchised and alienated Afghans from their own government because things didn't get better. They saw the corruption that that aid that was meant to help them instead fueled, they saw the government getting weaker and more corrupt and they saw the violence getting worse and they saw themselves unable to protect their families, unable to um, access the kind of futures that they hoped for for themselves and their, their children and unable to sort of envision a future in which, you know, the one that they were kind of promised after 2001. Um, so why do I think that they were unable to tackle it, it was because they didn't try in the right way. I think there were those, myself included, who were around at the time of the surge or you know, when these questions were front and center as part of the counterinsurgency campaign, who were pleading for different solutions, calling out that these would only make things worse. Um, Ashri Serki, others have written about this, wrote about it at the time. Everyone saw this coming. So I don't know, I think there's part of this which lies in incentivizing with hundreds of millions of dollars in industry, you know, of, of, of consulting firms in London and DC and elsewhere and contractors and all these kinds of things and indeed NGOs and UN agencies to play into these narratives which misdiagnose the problem um, and, and fueling it with cash, right? I think it's, I'm pretty cynical about all of this. I think if you had, 1% of the money, <laughs> you probably would have been better off. I think a lot of Afghans don't find that they, they feel they benefited from all of these interventions which are quote unquote about stabilizing and providing them with services because at the end of the day, they don't have many of those services. They don't have many of those benefits. Um, so it's both incompetence, lack of accountability, um, a range of factors, again, uh, but I could go on for a very long time talking about that. Um, I guess on methodology and ethics, um, obviously Kieran and, and Matt's were there all the way through the, the standard uh, university ethics process, but everyone knows it's more complicated on the ground. When you're sitting with someone, when you're kind of trying to figure out how to do this safely, I, I would say I moved back to Afghanistan and I spent you know, a year and a half pretty solidly there and then many trips after that going back. And the first three or four months were just figuring out how to talk to people safely. And you only really do that by trial and error. Informed consent doesn't come from, you know, a tick box. It doesn't come from handing someone a form, right? We all still have to kind of do that, uh, but it doesn't, it actually doesn't address the ethical dimensions. And we all also know that. So you have to be able to read the room. Uh, for me, that was also about working with people who I developed really strong relationships with, who were my partners. They were not just translators or fixers or whatever you might call them. They were collaborators who we had a responsibility to each other to try and understand the situation and respect each other's point of view on it and, and listen to each other and, and talk to others to try and understand 
the best way to go about things. But it was also about, a lot of it was about, again, these relationships, about nonverbal cues, about understanding um, at, at what someone was trying to tell you when what they were saying was something different, which I think is often common in Afghanistan. And had I not worked there for a decade, I probably wouldn't have picked up on a lot of the sort of ethical cues or discomfort cues or, you know, the sort of, for lack of a better term, double speak that was that was going on. Um, and I'm sure that I still miss things, right? Um, so I think ethics in that sense was very iterative um, and it was very situational to try and understand, you know, was it appropriate to meet someone outside an area where they were coming from? this Taliban control? Yes, often. It was better to meet them outside. Would it be appropriate to talk to a woman in certain circumstances that, you know, would be different from talking to someone else? It was also about, you know, selecting different interlocutors. Again, a lot of it was about endlessly calling people for information and trying to triangulate and trying to learn from the experiences of others. And I, when I say others, I mean mostly Afghan journalists because they, they were the ones out there and were incredibly generous with their time um, and their advice to me about how to do this safely and respectfully. Um, so yeah, a lot of it was just learning by doing, but also uh, having a degree of humility and listening to people who were smarter than I was about all of it. Thank you. Um, there, are, there are a few questions um, about um, kind of the, the implementation or policy responses. And I'll come to those in a little while. I want to um, first get to the questions that are talking about um, kind of the nature of hierarchies and, and the, the local variations. So there's the first part of Nicholas's question was to what extent were Taliban strategies for dealing with civilians directed from the top? Or did lower level commanders have the freedom to adapt and improvise on the ground according to their own interpretation of what would work or what was necessary? Um, and then Ivan Gishawa asks, well, first of all, he congratulates you on your book. Um, and he asks um, about the point about social capital. Do you observe some variability in relationships between Taliban and civilians, depending on the level of social capital they enjoy in different locales? So, you know, in places where they recruit combatants versus places where they don't recruit. Um, so I guess to some extent, a, a question about local variation and local autonomy. Yeah, um, those are both really good questions and I'll try and uh, answer them as concisely as I possibly can. So when it comes to um, the top down versus bottom up, I think we saw with the Taliban insurgency from roughly 2006 onwards when they start to get a little bit organized, is this process of you know, commanders at the bottom are, it's really disorganized, right? There are these little like fighting groups and there's this, this leadership in Pakistan, it's really disconnected. They're all trying to figure things out in real time. Um, and you have fighting groups on the ground, making decisions, making policy. And the Taliban leadership at a certain point, seeing what's happening and saying, okay, we have to institute a hierarchy. Um, but when you do that, as things are moving along, it's necessarily top down and bottom up. And I think that's what we've seen with Taliban policy making. Um, another researcher, Ramatul Amiri and I write about this, um, about this top down bottom up policy making in a report for USIP because it, that's what we found was like, okay, how do we explain the fact that it's not totally decentralized and it's not totally centralized, that there is this give and take across the country with different, different nodes and different layers of complexity. But when it comes to this engagement with civilians, at a certain point what the Taliban leadership understands is it is absolutely central to their strategy, to their political and military objectives, that there's a degree of autonomy at the local level to cater to civilian preferences and desires and to keep the civilian population who is very pressured and very coerced by the Taliban, but to keep them on side, to keep from pressing them too hard, um, and also to keep local commanders happy, right? Afghanistan is an incredibly diverse country. Even amongst the Taliban, there is a diversity of opinions about things like girls' education or about you know, the role that elders should play in local decision-making, and you have to accommodate that. You can't push these communities so hard 
that they rebel. I mean, this is the insurgent's dilemma. You know, how much can you squeeze them without alienating them and pushing them to the other side? And I think the whole Taliban structure, and we're even seeing it play out now that they're in government, is that there is, okay, this acknowledgement of, okay, we formulate policies at the top that are broad and vague enough to encapsulate a range of practices at the local level. But over time, as the insurgency went on, especially with things like taxation or things like education, you saw the, the leadership trying to narrow the parameters of that local variation. So that's, that's kind of the dynamic. But when it came to striking these local deals, local commanders had a huge degree of autonomy about how they, how they dealt with civilian populations, just insofar as they were able to continue to win. Basically, they were able to continue to survive. The Taliban leadership wasn't hearing about massive discontent. Um, then then they, they had the ability to do that. Now, when it comes to the second question, social capital, one of the one of the big conclusions of the book was that for civilians, social capital was everything, especially lone civilians. I mean, NGOs, aid organizations, they had things to offer the Taliban. Um, community elders could deliver on like compliance of the community. But when it came to like ordinary people, their connections to the Taliban were everything. So it was not only about you know, were you related to a Taliban commander? How did you cultivate links across all of all of the people you had to negotiate with? You know, the, the Taliban commanders on this side, the Taliban commanders on that side of you, government officials. You know, how could you leverage business connections, people you went to school with, your uncle, your wife's uncle, um, someone you used to work with, how could you leverage this network in which you're embedded in, where ethnicity, tribe, work, uh, all of these things that we would call networking really <laughs> in our lives, how could you leverage that to, to navigate a safe way for yourself, your family, your community? So that's, yeah, as nebulous as that is, that is one of the main conclusions of the book is that social capital is essential. Excellent. There is um, a question by Jory, which is, is linked to that. So I'm going to throw it in. Um, you can you can come to it perhaps um, along with these other questions or not. You, you've kind of answered it to some extent, which is, is, is it the core of your book, really? What factors determine when the Taliban may be more yielding to community preferences versus when they respond violently to pressure from community? So um, kind of probably should have tacked it on with, with Ivan's question. Um, I wanted to ask you Tina's question as well, um, who thanks you for the interesting presentation and discussion. How do you think this kind of important research could be better disseminated to policymakers so that they could incorporate it more in their policies? Um, in the, the slight risk of overburdening you with questions, I'll also add Sophie's question on there because it's also about the implications of your research. So Sophie says, I wanted to ask whether you see the Taliban as different from other insurgent groups, is there something unique in their approach to negotiating, or what more broadly can we learn about insurgency and counterinsurgency from the experience of the Taliban? Um, those are again three really tough, good questions. We'll try to be concise. Um, in terms of Jory's questions, it's a very good one. Um, a lot of things is the short answer. I think the the last chapter before the conclusion picks apart all the different sort of um, temporal and other aspects. I think one is where an insurgency is at in their evolution. And that evolution, as I'm sure Jory will <laughs> know well, is not linear, right? You can sort of have a really organized insurgency on the ascendancy that gets not knocked back, disintegrates, has less capacity to negotiate, et cetera. I think there's a consensus in the literature of people who study this and I agree when insurgencies are disorganized they lack command and control they lack these structures to negotiate they lean back on violence and that's what we really saw with the Taliban and the third chapter in the book goes through their use of violence pretty extensively because I think this is a very important question to to dissect because violence is not only about the levels of violence I think you know the levels of Taliban violence over 2020 were eye-wateringly high. Yet, 
they were using that violence in much more strategic, controlled, intentional ways than they were in 2006, in 2010, even in 2014. So you have to look at the types of violence. You have to look at sort of targeted assassinations. You have to look at the use and placement of IEDs. You have to look at um, the way they treat prisoners, for example, those kinds of things. Violence can also be a form of negotiation. It can be part of that large, larger equation in which the Taliban is trying to force the community to do something. It is a form of leverage when it is more strategic. So I think we have to even break down violence into understanding, you know, decoding what different types of violence mean at different points of time. Um, but in terms of when the Taliban responded violently to like pressure from the community, in Afghanistan, I think it's different from other contexts in that you didn't have a lot of like uprising spontaneously or otherwise against the Taliban, especially not many that um, were not externally supported or organized. Uh, you had militias and things like that supported by the Americans and others. But there are only really a handful of instances I can think of where the Taliban had to crack down on it, where, where the community kind of pressured them so much that the Taliban felt that they had to, you know, it was more this give and take, a dialogue. Um, and even where the community revolted, there were several instances where the Taliban took that seriously and then replaced commanders who were abusive, for example. Um, so I think the Taliban might be an outlier in that respect, that you, you had this language of negotiation and communication with violence in the background, of course. Um, but yeah, that that was a working, a working modus operandi, I guess we can say. Um, when it comes to how to better disseminate, honestly, I supported and funded this work by writing policy reports. I've been an advisor to the UK Parliament and to ambassadors on my Khalizad and countless aid agencies and UN agencies. And I have done interviews and tweeted and done everything I can to try and use this to influence people's thinking and framing of the of the problems in real time. As much as an kind of academic policy wonk like myself can do that adeptly. I've at least tried. I've written foreign policy articles. I've written New York Times editorials, but it doesn't matter. Like it doesn't matter if people don't want to actually see it, if they are incentivized not to see it, if there are discursive barriers from even talking about something that challenges the dominant military foreign policy narrative you're just gonna be screaming into the void. I mean, occasionally you'll do a briefing where people think that what you have to say, you know, it is that second narrative. You know, they have their official work narrative and then you say something that earns you respect because you say what everyone in that room knows or is thinking or the smarter people in that room know or are thinking, but it doesn't seem to change policy. Um, I don't really know. I mean, I think the one thing that, that does sometimes change policy is confronting it in the media or calling it out directly. Um, I think, you know, I, I subsidized this work by doing a policy report, thanks to the Danish government who funded my work on a Taliban shadow state. And I guess that policy report, at least when, where, where I was sitting in Kabul at that time, made a lot of people really uncomfortable that their aid money was going to schools, that the Taliban was uncontrolling. And this, was not, I mean, this was not like headlining. Everyone knew this was happening, but to put it out in the public domain and take that second narrative and put it in a space where it's unavoidable can sometimes be useful, but I actually don't think I've had very much success impacting policy for those reasons. Um, and I, you did kind of overburden me, so I forgot um, what the, the third question is. The, I the apologize. third one was, um, it was about lessons, about whether the Taliban is, is unique or is yeah. it generalizable, and about counterinsurgency as well. Yeah, I can't really say. I'd like to offer an opinion. I think towards the end of the book, I try to offer 
an opinion that, hey, some of this could apply to Somalia or it might play out differently if you were to apply a similar theory to what's happened over the past um, eight to 10 years in Syria. But I really, really dislike when people opportunistically use Afghanistan in that way. <laughs> when they haven't spent the years on the ground talking to people and then make conclusions about, oh, this theory is surely what's happening there. I didn't want to be that academic. Um, I really wanted to engage deeply on one context and allow others who work on Democratic Republic of Congo or work on Somalia or Syria or wherever to, if they found parallels, to use that to help them find ways of explaining things. I think you know, I really react strongly to um, a lot of academic books that use a cross section of case studies where people haven't done the deep work. And I just think it's unfair and ethics, I think that's ethically irresponsible. And I draw a lot of inspiration from scholars like Jute for Weijin, for example, who I watched a talk of hers that um, one of the, the participants here, Dana Wegelin organized, where she really talks about, hey, you know, I know this context and I know my limitations and I know what I can actually add to the debate and it's not by overstretching myself to make comparisons about what's going on with the Mai Mai being similar to what's going on with the Taliban or even another another group in in the same country and so I would just respectfully leave that to people who know those contexts better I hope I hope there's something useful for non-Afghanistan uh, readers and I think I think there might be because I draw inspiration from people like Norwegian from others and and certainly their work has influenced mine but I wouldn't want to force it we have um, we have a, a few questions kind of more focused on the, the the more recent developments or the aftermath before we get to those let me just ask you one um, from Henrik who's talking about third party interventions um, empowering in quotation marks, local communities, you know, through PRTs or through NGO interventions. Um, how did those influence local communities' relationships with the Taliban? For example, did it increase in awareness of IHL by the locals? Uh, did that lead to better or worse treatment by the Taliban? Uh, I think, you know, one of the dangers of writing about how ordinary civilians negotiate with the Taliban is that you risk um, people misinterpreting that to mean that they have an extraordinary power to influence the Taliban. That's not what the book at all says. I think there have been a lot of strategies in Afghanistan, political and aid development strategies, access strategies that have put civilians in the middle in ways that have been unrealistic and borderline unethical. Um, people are doing the best they can, negotiating for what they can engaging with, with the Taliban as they can. And many people don't, they flee. I mean, as we've seen after August, but as we've seen certainly in the years leading up to that, they um, join the government side, they refuse, they avoid engagement as for as long as possible. But of course, no one can kind of engage uh, or sorry, avoid, avoid engaging with um, an insurgency on the ascendancy for forever. I mean, it's just impossible. They they want to control your life and your behavior. And at some point you have to find a way to navigate that. So, you know, I guess I'm skeptical. Like there have been community mobilizers or and elders, this example of Amman or other people I talk about in the book who do extraordinary things, but putting that burden on people and those kinds of like um, cookie cutter for lack of a better term interventions uh, that were meant to quote unquote, empower communities. I think in the face of violence, uncertainty and an international community, which was always going to leave and people kind of always knew that and a Taliban that was always going to be there and people kind of always knew that, they were, they were very limited in the impact that they could actually have. Um. We have a question from, from Kaiser, um, and I'll follow that by one from Jasmine. Kaiser asks, how flexible uh, is the Taliban in terms of its ideology? Is it willing to stretch it to gain more power? And then Jasmine um, asks, where do you think that the, the Taliban didn't really comprehend, fully comprehend the challenge that they'd face by taking control of the country? For example, the bureaucratic challenges, the government's challenges, 
which he says as a British Afghan, I have first hand contact with people on the ground. And there seems to be a, a kind of a limbo at the moment with those who previously had private and public sector jobs and they're waiting for government this governance decisions to be taken. Yeah, um, well, when it comes to ideology, the Taliban is very flexible. They're very pragmatic, which is really ironic when you think of the image of a hardline sort of Taliban um, driven by their, their vision of Islam. Well, it turns out uh, actually that can be very flexible when it contradicts with uh, their military and political objectives. You know, and I, I think we've seen that play out with the way that they have developed a taxation system as an insurgency using the idea of zakat sure, in ways that um, even to ordinary Afghans and villages, you know, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't render a judgment about what's Islamic and not, but what ordinary Afghans told me was like, you know, that's not, everyone knows that's not, that's the Taliban justifying taxation as Islam because they need money for the war effort, you know? so. People understand this, but there's also the role that the ulama and you know the ordinary village mullah or whoever plays in the Taliban is not this sort of um, removed a political role. It is very much part of the structure, and the Taliban's vision of Islam and its ideology is very much formed around its battlefield objectives. And I recently did a paper. Um, with again, uh, the, the scholar I mentioned before, Ramos Miri, on Taliban narratives around Al Qaeda. And their narratives around Al Qaeda are like their narratives around a lot of things, you know, whatever helps us to win the war, whatever helps us to, to continue to control things, to continue to uh, fight is that is Islamic, that is right, you know, there's no contradiction there. Um, and this, this mantra of, of things is, is interesting because it covers up a lot of differences of opinion, it covers up a lot of tensions, but ultimately I think you have a very um, flexible Taliban ideology when it comes to what they themselves perceive as something that um, threatens their survival, expansion, ascendancy. That doesn't mean that they're gonna be flexible on other things, right? The things that one might want them to be like women's rights, like yeah, all those kinds of things. So I, I qualify that flexibility by saying it's it's on their own on their own terms. But I think you find that with with a lot of a lot of um, insurgencies. The second question is really interesting, and you know I share your observations with uh, friends on the ground is sort of looking and watching the Taliban. I don't think, well, we know for a fact that they did not expect to the, the country to go to them so quickly. This, the, what seems to be clear is this big sweeping offensive in May was geared at uh, securing a government capitulation. Um, they figured that the government would eventually come to them with some kind of deal whether it was to, to remove Ghani and, and form some other kind of power sharing deal. We don't really know what was ideal, but we do know that that's what some of the Taliban leadership was expecting. That's been documented. I've heard that as well in, in conversations with people um, close to or, or in fact in the, the political commission. So they did that and then they gained enormous amounts of territory. They didn't realize, I think, how open the door they were pushing on was. Um, in fact, it was sort of like a doggy door they kind of slipped through. <laughs> I think, you know, had that so much of the country went to them, then also um, led to the more hardline military commanders who had been arguing for no peace talks and a military takeover all along. It, it gave them greater legitimacy and credibility. And I think there were many of them. And we saw this in different parts of the offensive. I won't go like into the weeds here, but we saw uh, commanders acting of their own volition, really going for certain small cities and things like this, which they then couldn't control. There was backward forward movement through April, May. But then what happened with the cities is you saw the Taliban lining up to sort of choke them and to prepare to besiege them. And yet 
they just gave way. The Afghan government never really sent the kinds of reinforcements, never had a clear strategy as to how to, how to fend off this Taliban offensive. And then of course, the Taliban surround Kabul, Ashokani flees, the Taliban in Doha say to the Americans, are you gonna provide security? Are you gonna, uh, you know, or, cause we are waiting, we're waiting. And they were, you know, in, in the city limits, and the Americans declined to do so, and then the Taliban took to Kabul. So I think, and there are definitely those within the Taliban movement who understood that this was an absolute disaster. I mean, how could they not? They were not prepared to take an entire country. And insurgencies, the rare few that um, gain power militarily or even through peace talks, they have time to prepare somehow. They have time through, especially if there's political dialogue, they have sort of capacity building. You, you saw this in, in what is now South Sudan. You, you have this time. It doesn't necessarily mean that things will go smoothly, that they will ultimately have the capacity or good judgment to run a country. The Taliban didn't have any of that. They were kind of moving from one day to the next and have not, and still do not have the time to think about these big picture issues. They also do not have the capacity um, they just don't have the people and many of the people who they would need, who they hoped to co-opt, I, I think rather naively, have fled the country. Um, so what we're seeing now, I think, is a Taliban leadership that is really grappling with the, the, catastrophe, the catastrophe of their success, basically. Um, um, yeah, that's, that's really interesting also quite depressing in, in a lot of respects, um, at least for the short term. Um, part of what you were saying links back actually to, to the last question that we have, which is about, you were talking about how you know, there, there wasn't the resistance that they were planning for, that they were expecting it. Um, is that in, in to some extent connected to this, the negotiations that were taking place on a local level? So Daniel had asked this question earlier, in the wake of the Afghan government collapse, do you see any additional political or security implications of the widespread bargaining around service delivery that you documented? For example, do you see the connections developed around service delivery bargains having facilitated the negotiated surrender of the Afghan government at a sub-national level during the 10 days leading up to August the 15th? So it's interesting applying your kind of, you know, the focus of your, of your research on, on, on that itself. Absolutely. I think you know, bargaining around service delivery was also it was bargaining around governance, it was bargaining around who, who will control and govern our lives. And that laid the groundwork, but also created these relationships and those social capital networks. And, you know, it reconfigured people's consciousnesses about who really had power and who really had control over their lives, regardless of whether or not there was still government presence, regardless of whether or not there would have been a map that said that area was under quote unquote government control. It was really the Taliban. Um, but I think also what you you have is is effectively a situation in which the the Taliban negotiated and coercively negotiated and pressured communities into a situation in which um, they told these communities year after year that they were coming back. You know, even, even during the surge, people knew that the Taliban would kind of come back. Um, certainly this happened after major offensives after 2014, uh, even in the Trump era, people knew that the Taliban would come back. But what happened with high level political negotiations the negotiations that started in 2018 in Doha was you had a gradual process of confirmation of all that at the political level. What you had was a recognition of the Taliban already having kind of the authority, already being a political force to be reckoned with and an understanding that their return to power, power sharing, absolute power, whatever, would be the way that this was going in the medium term. But on top of that, the way that these uh, negotiations unfolded, the fact that the Afghan government was excluded the fact that in response to these bilateral negotiations that excluded them that were between the US and the Taliban it fractured it didn't solidify you had a disintegration of 
the political alliances that underpinned the Afghan Republic. Um, and you really saw the psychological effect of the US sitting down with the Taliban and indeed signing a deal without even really genuinely uh, getting the buy-in of the national government that they were supporting. Um, you saw the psychological effect of that. And I, I think ultimately that also influenced um, the nature of the reactions or non-reaction to the Taliban advance, that people just fell back, that soldiers fled into Tajikistan or they um, struck deals. I mean, many, many did fight back. Let's, I, I'm not gonna underestimate the fact that there were, were bloody, bloody battles, but certainly in many cases, people understood and had prepared themselves for that moment. And, and that, you know, why would you, why would you fight the inevitable? You wouldn't. And I think that's that's really what happened. Um, thank you very much for for sharing this insight with us. I mean, it's I learn something every time every time we have these kind of conversations or I hear you talk. So the detail, the level of knowledge you've got from 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 your research is is really useful. Uh, and let, maybe that leads to the last very very tough question: um, Where can people find your book? Who is it published by? Where is it Where is it available? How much is it going to cost them? <laughs> um, it is available from Hearst Publishers. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Bookshop. You can get it, you know, wherever wherever books are sold. Sadly, there's not a Kindle edition quite yet, but I'm told that's coming in a week or two. Um, well, I mean, it's always possible that Amazon is lying to me, but it seems to think there's a Kindle edition. There's also okay, that's great. That's news to me. <laughs> Yeah, check it out. It's also a very affordable hardback. It's like twenty three pounds for the hardback. So um, <laughs> snap them up while they're there. Um, Ashley, thank you so much. Uh, re genuinely, just really, really valuable research. And um, also, you know, it's the it's the honesty with which you've done the research and reflected. I think the views views from the ground that I, I find really, really useful in this. Um, and obviously, more timely than perhaps even you would have imagined at the time of, of doing this research. But I think it shows, you know, just the quality of the research that you've done that um, you only have that one typo on page, whatever it is. <laughs> well, that, that I know about, I mean. <laughs> yeah, if we find any more, we'll, we'll send them to you. Yeah. Um, Matt, um, thank you so much, Matt, for, for the brilliant um, questions and reflections as well. Um, hugely appreciated. Um, thank you, everyone, for your questions. And um, the recording will be available on the War Studies YouTube channel um, relatively soon and we'll share that online. So thank you everyone for joining and thank you again, Ashley. Thank you so much.